All right, so I'm not supposed to choose, you know, lectures over lectures and say this is my favorite lecture or not. So I technically will not say that this is one of my favorite lectures, uh, which is that you read between the contours. So what we want to do today is we want to show how you can use complex analysis to solve problems you care about. So the idea is we want to turn integration, which is typically hard, into algebra, which is easy. So that's the main idea. So the idea is the residue theorem. So the is f is holomorphic in open set omega. Our gamma is a closed simple curve in omega. F has um, so f holomorphic in, uh, f is f has finitely many holes inside gamma, none on gamma, and is holomorphic in a neighborhood containing gamma. So you know, the question when you have something like this is, how general do you want to state the result? You can deal with poles on the line of integration, it's not pleasant. Let's just choose our contour deformant if necessary to miss any poles. So the picture you should have is, you know, we have some big set omega over here. We have some nice closed curve here, gamma. And we have finitely many points, you know, z1, z2, zn, where the function blows up. And other than those places where the function goes up, the function f is holomorphic everywhere else. And we'll say it's holomorphic in like a little neighborhood containing gamma. So we'll draw like a little open set containing gamma. How many of you have taken a graduate topology class? How many of you have seen proofs of jordan plankov theorem and stuff like that? Exactly. So for the purposes of this class, we're going to consider all of our curves are going to be nice curves. There'll be things like circles, rectangles, triangles, things along those lines. You can read Appendix B for the most general results you can have, you know, the general plane <coughs> curve theorem and whatnot. There's really no complex analysis in that. That's really topology. And so for, the, for our purposes, it's enough to consider stuff like this. It's always nice to have your function well-defined in a slightly larger set than what you're working with, so you can always move it a little bit off if you need to. The function is holomorphic, it's differentiable over here. I don't have to worry about any boundary behavior. All right, and then the following theorem is true. Then 1 over 2 pi i, the integral over the closed curve gamma of f of z dz is equal to the sum, and goes from 1 to, oh, well, I'm sorry. I guess we're doing k goes from 1 to n of the residue of f at zk, where z1, zn are the poles, and the residue of f at zk is the negative 1 term in the Taylor series there. So in other words, f of z would be maybe a to the negative n, z minus zk to the negative n, plus what the drop, plus a minus 1, z minus zk to the negative 1, plus a0, plus a1, z minus zk, plus da, 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 da. Okay. So this is the residue theorem. The, the function is going to have finitely many poles. At those poles, we need to know what the residue is. And the residue is just going to be the negative one term in the Taylor series expansion. There's lots of ways to calculate those values. And if we can calculate those values, then we can get the value of this integral. Okay? Any questions on the statement? I can't remember, have we proved this or have we just been very close to having proved this? I'm not 
not sure if we've you know, proved this more or general version. Let's consider the following. So here is gamma. C1, C2, Ck. And what we want to do is we want to replace the integral over, Z, over gamma with integrals over small circles about these points. So what we do is the following. We draw small circles about these points, and we go about all of those counterclockwise. No, sorry, clockwise, clockwise, clockwise. <coughs> what can we say about the function f in the region between these circles and gamma? So what do we know about f in this, in this big, massive region? F is holomorphic. F is holomorphic because we're staying away from the finitely many poles. And we assumed F is holomorphic except in these places, so if we stay away from these places, and in fact a little bit of a neighborhood around those places, F has to be holomorphic. Are these circles disjoint? I think you can take that. Yes, as long as we choose the radii sufficiently small, no. if radii very small, the circles are disjoint. So let's let you know, epsilon be less than one half the minimum distance between, say, zj minus zl. You know, if we choose something like that, if we look at how far apart all the different stuff is, if we choose the minimum of that and choose the radius to be less than half of that, why do I need a half? Yeah, there's two circles. I just wrote down a half as a force of habit to always give myself a little wiggle room so that I actually need that wiggle room because if I draw two of these, they could exactly hit, right? But if it's less than a half, so let me say put in a 12 or 2015, something like that, a half would suffice. So now, all we have to do is now make a nice closed contour. So all we want to do now is take a detour. And so we'll go down this line and come back. You know, go down this line and come back, go down this line and come back. So all those pieces cancel out. Is there a problem if some of these lines hit each other? Or does it not matter? It shouldn't matter. As long as we're coming in from the boundary here, you can prove maybe we're never going to go all the way in split the region up and have lines crossing each other. You should be able to have ways doing it. The lines might have to curve around a little bit. Or maybe you draw a connected dot, you know. Th there could be questions about, you know, can you do this without having the lines cross? Does it matter if the lines cross? But you should be able to find ways to do it, always sneaking in. And then what's the problem if the lines cross? I don't think there's any problem if the lines cross. <laughs> but just the just to have it is phrased as closely as possible to what we're doing. As a nice exercise, I believe you can do it so that the lines won't cross when there's only finitely many. But if the lines cross, it's not going to make any difference. We just want to have a nice region in here. And so now we get the integral over f, I'm sorry, the integral over gamma of f plus the integral over all the circles clockwise, what does that equal? It equals <coughs> zero, as f holomorphic. So we use the fact that f is holomorphic to say that the integral over this nice region is going to be zero. Well, then that means that the integral of f over gamma is the negative of the integral of f. So therefore, the integral over gamma of f is equal to the negative of the integral over all circles clockwise. Right? Well, if I have a negative sign, I can get rid of the negative sign if I switch the orientation, and now these become circles counterclockwise. And I can put in a factor of 1 over 2 pi i, 
So then 1 over 2 pi i integral over gamma of f is equal to 1 over 2 pi i integral of all circles counterclockwise. But for each of those, we can now write f and we can expand f out. And the only term that's going to matter is the negative 1 term. And so we've done this calculation before. So now use you know, the integral over a circle, you know, counterclockwise, of z to the m dz is equal to 2 pi i if n equals negative 1 and 0 otherwise. And so now for each one of these, we tailor expand f. And the only term that will matter is the negative 1 term. So tailor expand at each zk. And so you get 1 over 2 pi i the contra integral of f over gamma is going to be the sum k goes from 1 to n, 1 over 2 pi i. Let's call that circle ck. And then we'll have a sum m goes from, say, minus n sub k. This is where the notation can get a little painful. n sub k to infinity of a sub m z minus zk to the m. And I have to put a k over here because how many terms that go down could depend on the point I'm at. <coughs> but these are finite numbers. Okay. So we're assuming that f has only finite many poles, that these poles is some finite number. And now we want to say the integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals. Why can we do that? The Taylor series converges. The Taylor series converges. The few terms where this coefficient is negative in the beginning, I, those might be a little bit troublesome, but there's only finitely many of them. And then once we get to the meat of the Taylor series, that series is going to converge. The tail is going to become very small. So if you put in absolute values, the integral of the sum of the absolute values is finite. You can switch orders. So this is because the tail is small. So the important thing to note here is that is z ever equal to zk? Does z ever equal zk when we're doing these integrals? Yeah. No, we're on a circle. So what's going on is here is zk. And here is a circle of a very small radius. And this is where the point z lives. And so because z lives on the circle, z minus zk in absolute value is going to be of size epsilon. We can make that as small as we want. We have a radius of convergence here. We choose this number to be smaller than the radius of convergence. And we have more decay here than we can have both for the AMs. And so we'll be fine. Yes? A little bit having proof because I was writing things down. So switching orders, what, how does that finish the proof? Well, if we switch orders, now we have the sum of the integral of the am. The only term that survives is when m equals negative 1. Mm -hmm. When m equals negative 1, we get 2 pi i times a negative 1. The 2 pi i is cancel, and a to the minus 1 is the residue there. So we then get that this is just equal to the sum k goes from 1 to n of the residue of f at zk. That's our definition of what we mean by the residue. It's just the, the negative one Taylor term. This is, a, this is miraculous. We have reduced integration to finding one term in the Taylor series expansion. This is even easier than finding the Taylor series expansion. We only need one specific term in the Taylor series expansion. Any questions on the result here? Right. 
Let's see how useful this is. Let's consider a couple of examples. So in some sense, this is the high point of the class in terms of skills that you might actually want to gain out of 372 that you could potentially use in the rest of your life in another math class, in another physics class. This is it. This is the big one, the ability to evaluate integrals. And I'll try to give you some examples throughout the semester as to why we actually care about the integrals that this lets us do. So here is one of my favorite examples. So if you've taken probability with me, what function am I thinking of right now? I'm sorry? Gamma. Not gamma. This is a difficult function to work with. It has some bad properties. It's one of my favorite distributions. What's a difficult it's, co Cauchy it's the Cauchy distribution. So the Cauchy distribution. So f of x is 1 over pi, 1 over 1 plus x squared. So a probability distribution, f is a density if 1, f of x is greater than equal to 0, and 2, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx equals 1. Clearly, this function is non-negative. Its integral is finite. It's well behaved at 0 because I have the 1 plus. And as I go off to infinity, I have enough decay in the tails that it's going to converge. So this should always be a normalization constant. So if I just gave you the function 1 over 1 plus x squared, if you integrated that, what do you think you would get? Pi. And so because I want the integral to be 1, I multiply by 1 over pi. So if you ever have a function that satisfies 1, but doesn't quite satisfy 2, instead of 1 you get some finite number, not a big deal. Divide by that finite number. And you can then just renormalize. So the question is, how do we prove this? So one thing is to note that the derivative of r tangent of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. And then... The integral from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. This is going to be octangent of infinity minus octangent of minus infinity. What angle has an octangent of infinity? So if this is theta, if this is 1, um, that's an answer. I want to do it this way. So tangent is opposite over adjacent, right? So this is how I would want my triangle to be. This is the angle whose tangent is x. So the angle whose r tangent is x would be this triangle. What would be the hypotenuse? 1 plus x squared. And so what angle has an r tangent of infinity? pi over 2. And what angle has an octangent of minus infinity? I'm sorry? <coughs> Negative pi over 2. Negative pi over 2. Now you're going to remember, oh crap, you know, how do we define the regions of angles for the octangent functions and stuff like this? And so if you're not comfortable remembering that stuff, instead of going from minus infinity to infinity, we can go from 0 to infinity and multiply by 2. And then you don't have to worry, now where am I defining things? And then that becomes an octangent of zero. Okay. What angle has an octangent of zero? I'm sorry. What is the angle that has a tangent of zero? Zero. And you're left with pi. So you just have to prove that the derivative of octangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. The way you prove this is... You look at the function h of x is the tangent of the arc tangent of x. What is the tangent of the angle whose tangent is x? x. I can't ask a much easier question in complex. Right? I give you an angle, and I take its tangent. Which angle did I give you? The angle whose tangent is x. Find the tangent of the angle whose tangent is x. No. The tangent of the angle whose tangent is x is x. So now I can differentiate by the chain rule. I get h prime of x is tangent prime at arc tangent of x 
times octangent prime of x, and then derivative of x is 1. We can now solve for octangent of x prime, and you get octangent prime of x is 1 over tangent prime of octangent of x. Now you have to remember the derivative of tangent is secant squared. Is secant squared. If you don't remember that, you can use the quotient rule, tangent is sine of a cosine. You know what secant squared. You can figure out what secant is by looking at this picture. Ooh. Right? The cosine of theta of this angle is 1 over square root of 1 plus x squared. Secant will be square root of 1 plus x squared. We're going to be squaring things. There's the 1 plus x squared. And so it will come out as 1 plus x squared. So this is the proof. Okay? This is at least one reason why we care about this calculation from all those years ago in Calc 1. It allows us to easily integrate the Cauchy distribution. Now what's particularly nice about this is if we didn't want to integrate from minus infinity to infinity, if we wanted to integrate over a shorter region, we could actually do that because we have a closed form solution for the antiderivative. You must Remember that this is rare. Most of the time in your life, you will not have a closed form solution for the antiderivative. This is the big lie from Calc 2. Antiderivatives are very hard to find. Fortunately, and this is where complex comes into to the rescue, is a lot of times you don't need the entire spectrum of possibilities. You just need to integrate from minus infinity to infinity, or zero to infinity, or over something very nice. And complex analysis is wonderful at giving you integrals over something nice. So the idea is how to evaluate the integral from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx by a complex. So step one is complexify the function. No. Oh. <laughs> so the idea is, we have a function right now of a real variable. I want to find a function of a complex variable that looks pretty similar to this. Most of the time, it's pretty clear what that function should be. Any thoughts about what function we should use that looks a lot like 1 over 1 plus x squared? Yeah, let's try 1 over 1 plus z squared. Unfortunately for this problem, z's and 2's can going to be very easy to mix up. Put the slash on the z. Alright, so if we take this function 1 over 1 plus z squared, this is not so bad. This might remind you of one of the old sequence things we would do in uh, calculus. When we did the integral test, we had to find a function that was close to the sequence. And the rule of thumb was basically, if you see an n, replace it with an x. And most of the time that works. Most of the time, if you see an x, replace it now with a z. Sometimes you have to be a little bit more careful. Um, if I give you the function sine of x, you might replace this with like an e to the i z. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But for the most part, go like that. Now you try to look at where this function is going to be large and small. As z gets very, very large, this function is going to get small. It's going to be essentially 1 over the absolute value of z squared. So if I'm integrating over like a semicircular contour, I'm going to have lots of decay. So step two is choose the contour. Well, I want to get the integral from minus infinity to infinity. So I should be thinking part of my contour better be the real axis. And typically, we don't like working with infinities. Infinities are troublesome. So what we'll often do is we'll work from minus r to r, and then take a limit. Do I have to worry about this function blowing up anywhere in the real axis? No. Now I need to decide, do I want my contour to go up where I have plenty of space, or do I want to try to squish things going down? You're completely free to choose either way you want. No pressure. Which way should we go? Up or down? Up. Oh, good choice. <coughs> it doesn't really matter, but as a rule of thumb, I think we just have more 
familiarity just looks right to go this way. So now we draw a contour like this. What's nice is on the circle of radius r, the function has enormous decay. What's the length of this semicircle, approximately? Up to constants that I don't care about. What's the length of this circle? R. And the function is decaying like 1 over r squared on that circle. So the you know, worst case scenario, the contribution from integrating on this circular arc is going to be of size 1 over r. It's going to go to 0. So step two is choose the contour. Step three, find place. So where does this function blow up? We've got one over one plus z squared. What are the places it blows up? I negative i. So here's i, and here's minus i. So one of them is going to be in the contour, one of them is not. If we had gone the other way, it would have just been the other one that would have been in. Not a big deal. So find holes and residues. Alright, so now we actually have to do a little bit of work. So we have the function f of z is 1 over z squared plus 1. Find the residue at z equals i. Should I find the residue at z equals minus i? Do I need the residue at z equals minus i? No. No. It's not inside my contour, so I don't care about it. Right? At minus i not in contour, who cares? Don't care about it. Alright, so we want to write 1 over z squared plus 1 as a as say a to the minus 2 z minus i to the minus 2 plus a to the minus 1 z minus i plus a 0 plus dot dot dot. What is the only term we need? What's the only term we need in the expansion? The a minus 1. I don't care about any of the other stuff. Yes? Um, how come the a minus 1 term wouldn't be to the minus 1? Like z minus oh, you're right. Because um, I forgot to write the minus 1. Good finish. So we only need the a to the minus 1 term. So the question is, what is the best way to get this? Is it possible that I could have had an a to the minus 3 term in this? Could we have had an a to the minus 3 term? <coughs> now, we've got a 1 over z squared. I'm not going to get something worse than that. So the question becomes, what is the best way to do the algebra here? So how to do algebra. If you go back to Calc 2, you had a bunch of techniques of integration. Which one did you hate more than all others? Parts. Integrating by parts? No. That's not the one you hate most. Which one? I didn't like partial fractions. Yes, exactly. That's the one you should hate the most, right? Partial <laughs> fractions. 1 over z squared plus 1. Well, I can factor the z plus z squared plus 1 as z plus i z minus i. Right? This is how we knew the poles were at i and minus i. So I can write it now as some number a over z plus i plus some number b over z minus i. And a little bit of work shows it's 1 over 2i, 1 over z plus i, minus 1 over 2i, 1 over z minus i. They should be of opposite signs so that the z's cancel. The minus sign means the i's will reinforce and I'll get a 2i, so I have to divide by 2i. Okay? So if I use partial fractions, I can reduce the 1 over z squared plus 1 to these two pieces. I claim I only have to worry about one of those pieces. Which is the piece I have to worry about? The z minus i. Why do I have to worry about the z minus i? Well, this function, this piece over here, is holomorphic at z equals i. So if I just plug in z equals i, I get 1 over 2i, doesn't blow up. This will not contribute to the negative 2 or the negative 1 terms. I can just leave it as is. 
and I can just expand this piece over here. What's the residue? Negative one over two r. We're done. That's it. We've integrated. So the residue of f at i is just going to be negative one over two i. And this is the advantage of having the expansion you know, written as we have it. So now we get that the integral of one over two pi i integral over the closed contour of gamma of f of z dz is equal to just the residue of f at i, which is negative 1 over 2i. Now the integral over the semicircle of radius r of f of z dz this is going to be less than equal to 2 pi r over r squared minus 1. Why is it r squared minus 1? The function is z squared plus 1. So the worst case for us is if z squared is negative r squared and is canceling it is in the opposite direction as the 1. Otherwise, they're going to be a little bit larger because we'll have a triangle and we'll be adding. So the worst possible case for us is if z squared plus 1 is r squared minus 1 in absolute value. This goes to 0. So this is one of the key steps right now, is to figure out what is the integral over the different pieces. So you know, again, over here, the advantage is we're on a circle of radius r. And so in absolute value f of z, this is less than or equal to 1 over z squared minus 1. I'm making the denominator as small as possible to make the function as large as possible. And that will then be 1 over r squared minus 1. So this is just worst possible case. So do we all agree that the integral over that part is 0 in the limit? So we get, as r goes to infinity, we now get 1 over 2 pi i, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx equals negative 1 over 2i. Have made an algorithmic Excellent. So this yields, and I'm glad we did, um, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx equals, put all of the 2i to pi to the other side, equals minus pi. What do you think? Okay, why are you shaking your head? Because uh, it should be. It should be positive. If we're integrating a non-negative function, we should not have a negative number. We must have made an algebra mistake somewhere. Where do we make the algebra mistake? Where do you think the algebra mistake is? Like somewhere we went into the wrong part of the circle and used. 3 pi over 2. No, we did not go into the wrong part of the circle. Not a bad guess, though. Maybe the residue. The residue. So I said A was equal to 1 over 2i and B was equal to negative 2i. And when you multiply through, they have to be opposite signs. But when we multiply through, this is the z minus i piece and this is the z plus i. This is going to give us a negative 2i over 2i. The signs are opposite. That should be the minus sign and that should be the plus sign. So now when we do that, we fix that, this becomes a plus, this becomes a plus, this becomes a plus, and now we get pi. It is very easy to make algebra mistakes when you're doing these residue calculations. And so we just made a very small mistake here. Okay, 
Okay, we made a very small mistake there, and now we just fix and put the plus signs through. Check your work. We should have actually just checked and multiplied through and made sure that it actually does reduce to 1 over 1 plus z squared. I wasn't so upset that this happened, though, because I want you to be able to look at integrals and get some sense of what the answer is. Now, in this case, we have more than some sense. We actually did the integration out, and we know what the answer is. We know it's supposed to be pi. But the fact that we were getting a negative number here should be troublesome. Okay. There are other ways to do this. And so this was looking at the function as 1 over z squared plus 1. So how else could we do this? There's a couple of different ways. Um, what I want to do now is I want to go over another way to get the residue, and maybe even another way. Why do I care about finding the residue so many ways for this problem? Because depending on which problem you're looking at, different ways of finding residues will be more or less important. All right, so can I get rid of this? Yes. Um, can you just go over again why you can ignore the 1 over z plus 1? Sure. This function here, 1 over z plus i, is holomorphic at z equals i. So if I do its Taylor series expansion, it's going to have no negative terms. So the Taylor series expansion from this part cannot contribute to the negative 1 term. So again, one of the whole points in complex analysis is not to do the calculation that's given, but to do the calculation that's needed. You may think the problem is to determine the Taylor series expansion of f. It is not. I cannot emphasize this enough. The goal is not to calculate the Taylor series expansion. The goal is just to get this one term here. We don't care about any of the other terms. This does not contribute to the a to the minus 1 term, so who cares? So that's why I want to write it like this with partial fractions and ignore this piece. Okay. As a nice rule of thumb, um, well, I'll leave that <coughs> So there's a lot we can do on residues. So let's go back to f of z is one over z squared plus one, which one over z plus i, one over z minus i, and we want to expand. z equals i. This piece over here is already written in terms of z minus i. This piece, z plus i, is not. What should I do to make this look <coughs> good? Add zero. Add zero, right? When in doubt, if I'm asking you a question, you either add zero, you multiply by one, or you take a logarithm. Those are basically the three things I can do mathematically. <coughs> so how should we write z plus i? Well, we want to have things in terms of z minus i. So write z plus i as z minus i plus i plus i. This is 2i plus z minus i. And now we get f of z is 1 over 2i plus z minus i, 1 over z minus i. What is this looking a lot like? One over two i plus something small. Do you recognize this? Instead of two i, what number would you love to have? If I, had, if I had nothing there, then we're done. But if I have to have a non-zero number, what non-zero number would you love to have? One. one. So if I have one over one plus something, what is that looking like? Geometric, Geometric series form. Let's pull out a 2i. So again, the whole point is I want to emphasize how to do the algebra. It's one over 2i, one over one plus z minus i, over 2i, 1 over z minus i. And now we can just expand this using the geometric series formula, right? And so this is going to be 1 over 2i, and now if we expand this we get 1 
Now we should have one minus. Right? We don't have one minus, we have one plus. So I should really write this as a minus of a minus. If you want minus one is i squared, this is the same as z minus i times i over two. It doesn't really matter. So it's going to be one minus z minus i over two i with a minus sign. I'm sorry, the minus sign is three. Plus dot 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 things I don't care about times one over z minus i. Because remember, the only thing we care about is the minus one coefficient. And so when I expand this out, do I really care what the z minus i squared term is? No, because I only have a z minus i here. If I had a z minus i squared, uh, okay, then I might have to care a little bit more. Or a z minus i cubed, because z minus i to the four. Because I have a z minus i to the first power, the only thing that's going to matter is the constant term here. And so now, when I expand this out, I'm going to get 1 over 2i, z minus i inverse, plus stuff. And there's the residue, 1 over 2i. So the residue at i. So when we talked about the Taylor series expansion, you would have at most an a to the minus 2. It actually doesn't have an a minus 2. It has a pole of order 1. <laughs> and you can see that when you factor it. But we knew it couldn't have been worse than a minus 2. And this is another way to calculate. I really like this you know, method of calculating residues. Is I reduce it to something I know. There's a nice part here. Now what if this was a z minus i to the fifth? So we don't need that for this problem. But let's say we had something like that. So imagine we have g of z is f of z to the fifth, because that kind of looks like a z, 1 over z squared plus 1 to the fifth power. So now if we have a situation like this, this is going to be 1 over z plus i to the fifth, 1 over z minus i to the fifth. And we need to figure out the terms. Uh, one thing we can do is we can expand this out using the geometric series, raise that to the fifth power, and then which term do we need? Not the fifth, the fourth. So option one, expand by a geometric series, find the z minus i to the fourth power. Because if we have a z minus i to the fourth power, when we have a z minus i to the fifth power in the denominator, that will give us a one over z minus i. And that's the only way we can get the negative one term. So this is one approach. Are there any other ways we could do this? So method one is we could use the geometric series formula. It's actually a nice combinatorial problem. I know a little bit of how to do stuff like this. It's not seeming entirely pleasant to take the geometric series formula and now raise it to the fifth power because we need to keep up to the fourth term, which means when we expand, we've got to take the geometric series at least to the fourth term. If you root for the Yankees, you know, if they make the World Series in this class, I will make you do that as a personalized exam problem. <laughs> it's not pleasant. There's got to be a better way to do this. This is complex analysis. This is the class about ways to do painful <coughs> calculations easily. Let's think about what we really need. Do we need the Taylor series expansion of this? 
No. That's elephant gun mathematics. You know, I want the fourth term of this. I take the whole Taylor series expansion, extremely expensive, and then I look at just one term. Let's just go for the one term we need. How would you find the z minus i to the fourth term in that? Let's let h of z be 1 over z plus i to the fifth. It's z plus i to the negative 5. Let's just take some derivatives. How many derivatives do we need to take? So, do you remember we're supposed to use Roman numerals for derivatives? Beyond three primes, you're supposed to use Roman numerals, or you sometimes put the number in parentheses. Uh, then we want the fourth derivative at z. So when we take the fourth derivative, we're going to have negative 5, and then the derivative of this will be to the negative 6. So we'll get negative 5, negative 6, negative 7, negative 8 z plus i to the negative 9. And then we want this at i, so the h, oh, wonderful, the, the i is not the square root of negative 1, it's a Roman numeral. At i would be 8 times 7 times 6 times 5, the negatives cancel. i plus i is 2i, so we would have 2i the negative 9. Is that the residue? Or is there a factor I'm missing? Yes, we have to divide by the factorial. And then once we do that, we'll be done. So remember, h of z is going to be the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of the nth derivative at i divided by n factorial z minus i to the n. And now if we just keep taking derivatives, so if we take n derivatives, the n is going to be an n factorial cancel with that perfectly. And then we're left with the z minus i to the 0. And so, if we want to calculate the residue, we needed the z minus i to the fourth term. So the coefficient of z minus i to the four is going to be the fourth derivative at i divided by four factorial. Or eight times seven times six times five <coughs> over four factorial 2i to the minus 9. It turns out, you know, if I want to show off, I can show off a little bit, I can make this a little bit nicer. This is screaming at you to do something. You should hear voices in your head now telling you to do something. Yeah, this is looking a lot like a choose. What do I want to put in the numerator? I want an 8 factorial. Can I just make this 8 factorial? I can put a 4 factorial over 4 factorial. So this is the same as 8 factorial over 4 factorial, 4 factorial, you know, 2i to the minus 9, or 8 choose 4, 2i to the minus 9. And maybe there's something really deep going on that a combinatorial coefficient is emerging here, that this is somehow related to some very interesting mathematics. So it's not a coincidence, there really is something good going on here. Okay? So this is a good place to start for today, uh, based on the fact that it's 1050. It also finishes this problem, it shows you several different ways of approaching this. I'm going to do another lecture on contour integration. I want to do the problem where I was a smart ass in college, and show you several different ways of handling sine of x over x, sine squared x over x squared, and how you deal with stuff like that. Okay.